Hi, I'm Bill Cusack of Peoria Cookers, and the purpose of this presentation is to give you an overview of the Meat Monster with the internal firebox and to show you what it can do for you. Now in the next few minutes I want to show you lots of pictures of what you can do with the Meat Monster. And one of the really neat features is that you can use it for indirect cooking and you can also use it for direct grilling. And because nobody wants to buy a cooker that will do everything but nothing well, we have painstakingly designed the Meat Monster to be very effective as both a grill and also as an indirect cooker. In fact, it was a specific goal in the design of the Meat Monster for it to be the owner's cooker of choice for all outdoor cooking, big or small. So as we say, use it to cook a whole hog or a few hot dogs or anything in between. And I'm going to show you how it is not only easy and accurate and predictable to use, but it's also easy to clean afterwards without giving up the superior flavor that you get in with wood and charcoal. The key to understanding why the Meat Monster is so easy to learn to cook on is the thermal couple, and we're going to discuss that in a while. But basically, you simply set the temperature you want, and it will hold that same temperature for whatever period of time you want it to hold it, unattended. So you don't have to come back and add charcoal. You don't have to come back and even check on the temperature. It will be there. So you determine how long you want to cook these pork shoulders and at what temperature and you program that temperature and then you walk away. And the same is true for prime rib, uh, beef brisket, uh, ribs, salmon, uh, whole pork loins, whatever you want to cook, you set the time and the temperature and it holds it perfectly. In a similar manner, I'm going to show you that when we use the MIF for direct grilling, it's easy to start, easy to use, and very predictable with regard to the results. In the top picture you see the Meat Monster offset firebox or what we call the MOF. In the bottom picture you see the Meat Monster internal firebox which we refer to as the MIF. Now these units are both very similar. In fact the bottom unit is simply a modification of the upper unit. What we've done is we've taken the firebox which is external or offset and we've moved it inside. So it gives the Meat Monster with the internal firebox a slightly smaller footprint. The other thing that we've done is we have removed the crank up mechanism. So it makes the unit a little bit lighter and a little bit smaller. It gives it a little bit smaller footprint. Otherwise it is the same in terms of its ability to cook, in terms of its uh, insulation and so forth. It's the same as the MOF. Before we go into the details of the Meat Monster, let's ask the question, does it work? And at Peoria Cookers, when I come up with the design, we test it at Peoria Cookers and also I cook at home almost every weekend testing one thing or another. But a shortcut to understanding how well the Meat Monster performs is to look at its track record in competition because these teams are very particular. So this is a great trial run uh, for what I design. And I am much indebted to Mike and Beth Wozniak. Uh, they used the Meat Monster for the first year exclusively in competition. That year was 2010. And in that year they won the Jack Daniels World Championship 2010. They also won the Kansas City Barbecue Society Team of the Year and they also were winners of the Kingsford Points Chase 2010. So all three of these huge contests they won in the year 2010. Now these competitors are good no matter what cooker they're using. But I have to think in some cases the Meat Monster has made a difference. Patrick McCrate had cooked for several years and not won a grand championship. And as a matter of fact some people cook their entire career, compete their entire career and never win a grand championship. After he bought the Meat Monster he won three grand championships in a row and the grand championship is the most points in that cooking event across the board for all categories so he did this three times in a row which qualified him to go to the world's championship Jack Daniels Invitational in Lynchburg Tennessee and in that competition 
he won first place in brisket. So at least in his case, I think that the meat monster made a significant difference. So if the meat monster can prove itself and do well in competition, then it should do well also in home use. And that's what we had in mind when we started building the meat monster with a metal frame so that we can ship it to the homeowner and the homeowner can then have masonry people come in and put brick around it. Brick or stone. So this has been very popular recently in terms of uh, configuration of the meat monster. The meat monster on a trailer is relatively small, especially with the sleeve removed as you see here. It's approximately six and a half feet long and it's approximately four and a half feet wide. So it has a fairly small footprint. And on a trailer it's easy to handle. So if you want to take it out for tailgating or take it to the beach or over to a friend's house, it's easy to haul and move around. And it's small enough that we can put it on a pallet and ship it anywhere. So we strap it down to a pallet like this and then right before we ship it we shrink wrap it for protection and it can be lifted by a forklift and transported easily. When it gets to you all you need to do is simply take the sleeve which is packaged back here, put it in to the front part of the trailer and pull it away. So it is that easy. There is no assembly when it gets to the final destination. Please remember also that any meat monster we make can come on a trailer like this with a couple of propane burners and an open pit grill and lots of chrome and shiny stuff if you wish. In fact, we can even make one double fancy like you see here. We actually have two meat monsters on it, two open pit grills, and a double fish burner on the front. So this is quite a rig. In an almost magical way, the Meat Monster combines the old world with the new world. It combines the flavor that you get with wood and charcoal with the new technology in terms of maintaining temperature unattended over many hours. And on the bottom what you see is a thermal coupled system. This particular one is sold by Barbecue Guru. It consists of two probes. You have an air temperature probe here and then you have a meat probe. Then you also have a little computer about the size of a cell phone. And then you have, of course, a power supply. And the power supply provides a, a power for the 10 CFM fan or 25 cubic feet per minute fan, if you wish. And the way the system works is that you program the computer for a certain threshold. For example, 325 degrees or 225 degrees or a holding temperature of 160 or 170 degrees or whatever temperature you want. And then it reads the temperature inside the cooking chamber and if the temperature falls below your threshold, for example 225 degrees, then the computer turns the fan on, the fan blows air in the fire and that raises the temperature until the temperature gets to your threshold and then it shuts the fan off. This system is so sensitive that it will usually make those changes within one degree. So for example, it's not unusual to program this for 225 degrees and then after it gets the temperature you may come back in two or three or four or five or ten hours and it's still at 225 degrees. So it is incredibly accurate and it will maintain this uh, over many hours as I'm going to show you in some of the upcoming presentations. Now I will also mention to you that you need this system but the other thing that you need which we'll get into in a little while is you need a cooker that is extremely efficient so that it won't burn out all your charcoal and you need a cooker that is airtight because you have to be able to control the fire entirely by this fan. You cannot have any air seeping in from an outside source because that would contaminate the supply and would raise the temperature beyond what you would want it to. Now I've recently taken this technology to a new level and it's certainly not necessary but it's really cool. So instead of using the controller which you see there we now use a Wi-Fi controller and everything plugs into that Wi-Fi controller and it hooks into your Wi-Fi at home. So now you can go anywhere and control the temperature, raise your threshold up or down and also monitor the meat temperature. So what we're looking in the lower portion at here is my cell phone. So this is my cell phone 
And if you take a look, the actual temperature inside the cooking chamber is 215 degrees, and I have it programmed for 215 degrees, and it's not unusual that it's at that accurate. My meat temperature is 163 degrees, and it's programmed for 195 degrees, which means that when it gets to 195 degrees, an alarm will go off. These set points we can change remotely from anywhere, anywhere that we have access with our cell phone. The next row down says open, and that simply means that we have additional slots for additional meat product temperature probes that are not being used now. So this is really neat, it's really new, and it's also nice even if you don't leave the house, if you're walking around the house and you just want to check on things, rather than have to go down and look at the temperature, you just pull out your iPhone and you can know exactly what's going on. So we start off here with a little bit of fire, and I usually put it towards the side of the fire window. So we get that going a little bit, and then we dump more charcoal in on top. And you can start it off uh, by putting it in a chimney outside the cooker, or you can use fluid if you wish, or you can use matchlight charcoal. And then we put on the long burn internal firebox extension. So that gives you almost 24 inches of height in terms of the storage for the charcoal. And we throw a little bit of wood in. You can use hickory sawdust. You can use wood chips. You can cook as many of the competition people do with charcoal alone and nothing else. So all of those options are available. And then we fill up the internal firebox at 4.30 p.m. So we're ready to go for a long cook. So here's the basic setup. What you have is the Guru here. And it has a cable that goes over here and in to measure the air temperature. And we programmed this for 250 degrees. And then this other cable here goes down to the back of the cooker where we have the fan going into the firebox. And it's set for 250 degrees and we start this off late in the afternoon. So what we see here is the firebox now as it's become operational and this is what we call the fire window right here and then the heat is intense coming out of there uh, but the fan only kicks on once in a while so it's not a big blast it's a nice steady heat and since the unit is completely insulated and the heat will be very even throughout you will not have to turn the pig or rotate the pig you just put the pig on and you leave it now I open the lid here only for purposes of photography. Otherwise, this cooks totally unattended. But to answer a question that may arise when you look at this photo, you can see the cut along here and also there's a cut up this way. And I can tell you what that is. The ribs are relatively thin. And so I found that if I cut the hog across the back and telescope those ribs and they're thicker and they cook better. Um, also, the pork loins have very little fat in them and so they cook differently than the shoulders or the hams so I take out the pork loin I put those on later or cook them on another occasion so those are the modifications that you see okay so the hog is done it's 11 o'clock the next morning we've cooked a 101 pound hog at 225 degrees for 18 hours without adding any charcoal we don't have to move the hog and without any temperature adjustments whatsoever Okay, so you can get an idea of the height of the extension tube, but if you look at the insert here, the extension tube really comes right just below the level of the grill. And this is how much charcoal we have left. So I'm going to estimate that we have at least six hours of remaining charcoal after 18 hours of un unattended cooking. So it could still go for a long time. And this was in early November. I believe the temperatures were in the 40s. So it's very conservative. It's very, very easy. Now, easy is a word that I love. The uh, removable aluminum pans catch almost all of the grease. Okay, this is what the meat looks like when it's taken off. And it's nice and moist, and that's one characteristic of the meat monster. Because the meat monster 
is very efficient and even for a long burn like this does not require a lot of fuel. It therefore does not require a lot of equivalent oxygen or air for that fuel. So since it uses fuel, little fuel, it uses little air and it doesn't dry the meat out. So there's very little airflow during these hours that it cooks and that's a huge advantage in terms of flavor. This is a good point to talk about how we control the temperature over 18 hours and how we're conservative in terms of how much charcoal we use. So what you see here is a fiberglass rope seal in the upper portion. It's embedded into an inverted U channel and then that comes down and closes such that the 1 4th inch steel edge plunges into the fiberglass rope seal to make it airtight. In addition to that the air intake is our patented monster vent which is actually located down here on the side and blows air into it. So the monster vent and the airtight seal means that we're not going to have any oxygen coming in that we don't want. To demonstrate how effective the airtight seal is, if you take a look at the upper arrows, they point to two lumps of charcoal. Now when we shut the fire down, plug the hole, those coals should extinguish, and they do. So if you look at the lower arrows, as you can still see that those two chunks of charcoal there were stopped in their tracks once you shut the air off. Now to some owners, like Matt Becker, this is not just a demonstration, it's a very useful feature. So Matt sometimes will get orders just for one or two briskets. And the way he handles that is he loads up his charcoal grill all the way up, puts his briskets on, cooks them for six hours, that's his routine. At the end of the six hours, he shuts the air off, closes it down, takes his briskets off. When he comes back the next time, he doesn't have to add any charcoal. He starts a fire with a propane torch in about 60 seconds. Puts, puts the guru on and he's good to go. He gets three six-hour cooks out of a full load of charcoal. So it's 18 hours in three different intervals with a full load of charcoal without having to add charcoal, clean it out, or anything. Now to bring the fiberglass rope and the quarter-inch edge together tightly so that it seals well, we use what we call a cam over lock and this is something that we manufacture in our facilities and it's actually removable and it's also adjustable so you can simply adjust the nuts on these and tighten it down as much as you want so it forms a really good seal. I think it's the best in the industry. Now this slide shows a cutout for one of the smokestacks and what you can see here is that the fabrication is with two one-fourth inch plates of steel and two inches of ceramic insulation in between. So it is some effort to fabricate because in reality it is a cooker within a cooker. But it is this type of construction and this type of insulation that makes it hold its temperatures and be efficient over long periods of time. And you know another huge advantage of the full insulation, even if it's additionally in the brick like you see right here, is that you can come out in the middle of winter and still expect to run this up to whatever you need. In this case we're at 310 degrees. So barbecue tastes good in the winter also and that's a big advantage of the insulated cookers. Now one thing we had to come up with in our design is our patented torsion spring lifting system for the lid. As you can imagine, of course, the steel is heavy and the ceramic insulation is very dense and very heavy also. So the actual lifting force for the handle without this spring system would be 134 pounds. Well, no one's going to lift that. So we have four torsion springs. This is one side. And it's adjustable with the nut that you see right here. So you can take a socket wrench and you can adjust it to the point where it will open on its own without any force or anywhere between that situation and 134 pounds. So it's common to want to have it around 5 to 8 pounds. And also we look at the hinges. They're half inch thick hinges. And in between if you can kind of peek in here you can see that we have bushings. On all of the moving parts we have bronze bushings with SAE 30 oil impregnated in the bushings. They're actually not bushings, they're actually sleeve bearings and rated for 4,000 RPMs. So they're smooth and they're very effective and it just glides open. 
So it's a good, strong lifting mechanism and one that would simply last a lifetime. So let's take a look at cooking indirectly with salmon. Salmon's one of my favorites and it's really pretty easy to cook. But we'll use this little part of the uh, presentation to show you how we use hickory chips or sawdust or you can use chunks of wood, whatever you want, to control the degree of smoke that you get. So I simply season it with a little bit of garlic salt, lay some onions over the salmon, put it in a disposable aluminum pan. Now I like to have a light smoke flavor on my salmon and the nice thing about the MIF is that you can actually control and adjust the amount of smoke that you get on your salmon or anything that you're cooking in the MIF for that matter. So what you see in the top here is I have just hinged up the lid on the internal firebox. I'm going to dump this hickory sawdust down the front wall of the internal firebox so it's going to be right in the vicinity of the fire window. And then when I put the lid back down like you see here, smoke is going to start to billow out of everywhere, especially the fire window. And so then we close the lid down and we see this beautiful blue smoke. Gray smoke is fine, blue smoke is fine, brown smoke is too strong, it'll give you a bitter taste. And then you look at the salmon and you can get an idea from the color of the onions and the color of the salmon about how much smoke flavor you're going to have. So it's nice to have it adjustable and it's nice to have it be predictable. This is another way to cook salmon. If you don't have an internal firebox, if you have a moth and you want to simply put a charcoal basket down here with charcoal on it, throw a, st a stick of hickory on top of the charcoal, or if you have a MIF but don't want to use the internal firebox, this is just another variation. You can close the lid down on this and you'll get a nice gentle smoke flavor on the salmon. Now the chicken I like with a little more flavor to it. So I will dose that a little more with the sawdust. You can do the same thing by chopping little pieces of hickory wood off of a small diameter log. Like say, I, I would picture them like hamburger slices. You can throw those into the internal firebox also. The only real restriction is you don't want to put a large piece in there that won't drop down because if it won't drop down you can get what we call a bridge. It doesn't happen very often but you want to at least be able to have it drop down. So these chickens based on their color are going to have a little more smoke flavor but it's still the kind of red color that I know I'm really going to like that flavor. One of my favorite things to cook on the Meat Monster in terms of indirect cooking is the turkey and it's fun to get it to come out to the golden color. Uh, you can use that partly with smoke but also you can get the color by basting it like we see here. And when I baste it like that I like to cook it a little bit hotter and it's not a problem to run the Meat Monster at 325 degrees or 350 degrees or for that matter if you're ahead of schedule and you want to hold your meat, you wrap it in foil and you put it down to a temperature of 150 or 140 or whatever. Um, I've even held it all night long at 140 simply because I didn't want to restart the fire and I wasn't cooking through the night so it will use very little charcoal at 140. I'll come out the next day and turn it up and it's even more accurate than an oven. But what I'm showing here is that we're basting the turkey. It has a lot of moisture Typically, turkey will tend to dry out, so you can put a water pan in if you wish. But as I mentioned earlier, this cooks with so much moisture that you don't need to. I was recently given a demonstration on how to cook a whole hog at a cooking class in Chicago. And what you see here is when I open the lid, you can see the moisture roll out. And that's what you would expect. Also, you may notice I have a brick here, and that's simply to hold the thermometer at different levels and it will read the temperature warmer as you go higher and cooler as you go lower as you might expect. Now when we cook in a mobile configuration like this sometimes you don't always have 110 power so I can use a portable power supply like the one you see here and I simply plug the power supply into this little battery charger and that will provide enough energy to run the Guru all through the night. And I will tell you that those at the cooking class were amazed when I shut this down at the end of the evening and went off to the hotel with the rest of them and came back the next morning. So I left it all night unattended as I do routinely.
So let's remember that cooking is simply a preface to eating and the moisture really is about the flavor. So that when we cook a whole pork loin like this and we slice it for our guests, we'll see that the, it glistens with moisture and moisture helps to impart flavor. So there's no question that a cooker that cooks efficiently and holds the moisture better, you end up with a product that has much better flavor. So I'm just going to make a couple more points about indirect cooking, then we're going to move on to direct grilling. This is the meat monster with the internal firebox, and what we're looking at here is what we refer to as the main cooking level. And this has stainless steel bars here, and they're removable. Below that is what we refer to as a lower level, and it's shown here with uh, expanded metal mild steel. In the bottom, there's a hole and that's for easy clean out. It's a drain. If we look at the drain from the bottom, it's simply a brass valve drain. You put a bucket under there and turn that and it drains real easy. So if you want to hose it out. So cleaning is easy. But if you notice in a lot of the slides, I use aluminum disposable pans. If you want to slide a disposable pan under your ribs or whatever you're cooking, or if you want to cook your meat inside the aluminum pan, it eliminates all of the cleanup. So it's something to consider. Now this picture shows what we refer to as a two removable third rack. So now you can see here you have three different cooking levels which number one gives you a lot of capacity. But it also gives you a variation in temperature. So what the competition people and many restaurant owners have really liked about the Meat Monster is that with one fire as they say, with one fire you can have several different temperatures throughout the main cooking unit to get different effects simultaneously. So let's take a look at that. So here I put on four pork shoulders and aluminum pans and I go to bed. And they're on the third rack. And the reason I use the third rack is because the third rack is my first rack of choice because it cooks most efficiently. So if I don't have uh, the other racks taken up and I got plenty of room, I start off on the third rack. So after 14 hours and 43 minutes, in other words, the next morning I come out and the bone in the shoulder can just be pulled right out. So I know that the shoulder is done. So the pork shoulders are done and yet we want to continue to cook and we want to use one fire, which you can see down in here, to continue to cook at 275 for other food products we want to put on and we want to hold these shoulders warm and out of the way. So we put the shoulders down in the lower level and then on the upper level we put a combination of a couple of pork loins and a couple of whole chickens and we continue to cook at 275 and here's how we do this. Utilizing the upper smokestack we try to channel the heat high and through the top of the cooker keeping the lower level down here cooler. So you can see 175 on the analog here. And I'm going to show you a close up. You can see 275 on the one on top. And we do this simultaneously. So we have the smokestack that goes through the top slightly open and the bottom smokestack is closed. So this is for effect. And we look at the upper temperature and it's at 275 and we look at the lower temperature and it's 175. So with one fire we've been able to create a discrepancy of 100 degrees. So we're almost cooking like with, with two cookers. And this is what the competition people really like. And also the catering people because it gives them versatility. So it's a small cooker with a great deal of versatility. And these photos were sent in to me by Richard Milks, and he is actually using three levels. So he has some beans on what we call the third level. On the main level, he has ribs, and and if we take a look at this level, you can see he has some chickens down below. Now you're going to want a little warmer temperature down below, so you would utilize the lower smokestack, which would tend to take the heat from the internal firebox, keep it relatively low as it exits the main cooking chamber. And this is Joe Eaton. He's got a couple of pans on the right and he's loaded with ribs. So what he's using here actually is a third rack which is removable and also rib racks that we've made for Joe. 
and you only need a little bit of spacing. So I don't know how many ribs he's got on here, but lots. And as I remember, I believe he's cooking some on the lower level at the same time. So again, the reason we named this unit the Meat Monster is because of its relatively small footprint, relatively small size, it actually cooks like a monster in the sense that it has a lot of capacity. Now, Matt Becker recently bought two Meat Monster internal fireboxes from Peoria Cookers and he has catering business in two different locations. But just as an example of what he did recently, he was cooking for a wedding of 500 people. And the way he did this was to cook 24 briskets, putting them on at 6 o'clock in the morning, and cooked them till 2 p.m. And then he took them off and put them in coolers to keep them warm. And then he put on 24 pork loins and he cooked the 24 pork loins from 2 o'clock until 6 o'clock. So by the end of the day, Matt had cooked 24 briskets like you see here and also 24 pork loins. And what's interesting to see about the briskets, in order to get some spacing and smoke flavor, what he used were rib racks that we made for him and he simply inverted them like you see here. So I've only scratched the surface on indirect cooking, but it's time to move on to uh, direct grilling and a combination of direct slice indirect grilling because oftentimes we'll put it over the heat and then move it off to the side. So let's take a look at the Meat Monster internal firebox and how we would grill on it. One of my favorite things to grill are large New York strip steaks. And to get started, we simply lift out the internal firebox reach in and lift out the ash pan and go and dump that. So now we're going to start the charcoal. And the internal firebox with the lid off is designed to have an airflow that will ignite the charcoal very rapidly. In this case we use Kingsford match light. Now that has oil in it, it has lighter fluid in it. And so once you light it, it just takes off. Some people don't like to use it because it does have lighter fluid, but my feeling is by the time you're ready to go, it's all burnt off. Another way to go is to use these chimneys, as they call them, and you can even use the Guru fan like you see right here to blow into the bottom of the chimneys that will really get the charcoal going quickly. But my point is, in either case, it's easy to start it and easy to get it going quickly. So now I'm gonna go inside and cut the New York strip steaks the way that I want them and it's usually fairly thick. Now this is the charcoal and I oftentimes use my cell phone to keep time so it's been 12 minutes and 16 seconds since I started the charcoal and I could have come out probably in five or six or seven minutes and gone ahead and thrown on the steaks but it took me that long to go inside and cut the steaks. Now a comment I would like to make about the internal firebox. It is designed with the lid on to cook slowly, controlled, long burn, and the charcoal burns from the bottom. So when you do indirect cooking and you put the lid on top of the internal firebox, the charcoal will burn from the bottom and gravity will bring it down and feed the fire. With the lid off, it's different. It's designed so that the air will come in from the lower right area of the screen as you see it here through the monster vent under the charcoal and then like a venturi effect this tube will suck air up with the heat so you'll get a tr tremendous intense fire. It is controllable you can go to the monster vent and shut it down but it behaves in such a way that you have a nice intense fire to do the grilling. Now the fire here is more intense than it looks and we're going to start off on the lower level just above the internal firebox. And since the fire is intense, this is going to require our attention for the next few minutes and we're going to move it to higher levels then move it off to the side and once we move it off to the side then our time of involvement will be much less. So we can see that the fire is getting quite intense here and I've seared them about as much as I want to sear them so I'm going to raise them to a more gentle level and I simply move the third rack over in place and the fire at the, this level is still uh, quite hot which is the way we want it. 
And so now we move the stakes to the left so they're no longer directly over the fire and we want them to heat soak. And the other thing that we're going to do is we're going to take the hickory chips that you see in this coffee can, dump them right onto the fire, and we're going to close down this monster vent here so we limit the air going to the fire. So we're going to have a little bit of a suffocation effect on the fire. That's going to result in incomplete combustion and whenever you get incomplete combustion you get smoke and that's what we want to impart a nice hickory flavor to these steaks. And so now we've dumped the hickory right onto the hot coals and as we close it down within about 60 seconds we start to see the smoke come out. And you can give it these bursts of smoke however often you want to, depending upon how much of a hickory taste you want. Usually about one burst like this, which may last five or ten minutes, is enough for what we are doing. Now one thing that's going to happen when we close the lid is that the temperature is going to soar, and that's not a problem, even if it goes to 450 or 500 degrees. These are thick steaks, and they'll need a little bit of time to heat soak through. So we're looking at maybe an additional 10, possibly 15 minutes to get them the way that we want them. But they'll be nice and even, as I'm going to show you, in just a few minutes. And as I lift it up and look at them now, I can tell by their color they're going to have a wonderful hickory flavor on them. And as far as temperature goes, we're looking in the 125 to 135 range. And it depends upon individual taste, how much you want them done. So after a while, you'll learn to check them at a temperature that's suitable for you. And I like them medium rare. And I like them to be medium from top to bottom. Now this is exactly how I like my steaks done. But I will say to you that however you want your steaks done, whether you want them done more or less, you should be able to consistently cook them to that level with just a little bit of practice and use of the thermometer on the meat monster. You should also be able to simultaneously cook steaks in a different fashion at the same time by moving them around appropriately. But what I like particularly about this is the fact that it's medium rare from top to bottom. I don't like it when the steaks have a quarter inch at the top that's done too much and a quarter inch at the bottom that's done too much and then too rare in the middle. I like it to be even throughout and the only way to do that is to sear them lightly and then move them off to the side and let them heat soak through. Now you don't always have to use the internal firebox. What we're using here is a small shoebox size, so to speak, of what we call a charcoal basket. And we line foil underneath it simply for easy cleanup. So it's easy to start a little fire like this and even cook a few hot dogs. It would be my cooker choice to use because it's easy to clean out. And it's versatile in a sense as you can do a few hot dogs like this or you can do a few New York steaks in a similar manner. The upper slide was sent to me by Joe Eaton and Joe is cooking a number of lobster tails grilling them over a little wider area so you can open it up as much as you wish depending upon how much you want to cook. And the lower I'm grilling some shish kebabs over the fire and indirectly I'm cooking uh, salmon simultaneously. Recently I had an occasion to volunteer to cook for about 70 people at the Chicago Hope Academy. And so the configuration I used was what you see here which is the charcoal tray on the left and the internal firebox on the right. Now what we could expect is what we see here that the internal firebox because of its design and its airflow will have a very intense fire by contrast, the charcoal pan has a less intense fire, and so it gives us some variability when we're grilling. And as we grill these and complete these, then we can put them off to the left here in the disposable aluminum pan. So on a relatively small area, we can cook for quite a large number of people, and we can actually hold it for some time too in the aluminum pan. So it's really pretty easy to take on a fairly large job. We now have charcoal pans with these vertical posts and the posts have notches and the advantage of the notches is that you can put the shelf in at different levels.
So as we see here, we have it at one of the lower levels and the coals are hot, we're ready to go. And you can close the lid even with these vertical uh, posts in place. So there's enough room to be able to close down over that. So what we're going to do here is to dump some uh, sawdust on here. And then we're going to close the lid and we're going to generate smoke to give flavor to our fillets. And after the fillets are done, we're going to take those off. The smoke has died down. Now we're going to put lobster tails on. And John Christie of Minneapolis had the occasion to cook for a corporate lunch. And whenever they say lunch, it means you've got a limited amount of time. He was able to cook 80 steaks in 35 minutes and he essentially used a couple of charcoal pans and used the whole surface, the whole 30 by 60 surface, which you certainly can do. So I want to show you a couple of photos that have been sent in to me from Meat Monster owners which shows their creativity. On the bottom, what you see here is a small charcoal basket which has been inverted and is used to hold a disposable aluminum pan. Inside the aluminum pan is charcoal. So it's easy to grill, very easy to use, and certainly easy to get rid of. And this is a variation that was sent to me by Troy Black who used to write a barbecue column for Southern Living Magazine and now he's with Sam's Club. But he simply took an aluminum pan and invert it upside down then put another one on top of it right side up and put the charcoal in the top one to grill ribeyes. And hot dogs and brats taste so much better over charcoal so how much trouble is it to take an aluminum pan like this throw a little match light in there start it up and come back and cook it and then when you come back to clean out you simply take this aluminum pan and dump it and reuse it or dispose of it. So it's that easy to do it there's no reason not to have hot dogs and brats that have a good charcoal flavor. Now we've talked about the monster vent, but we haven't talked about how it works. Essentially, when the spin plate that you see here is closed as it is in the upper left, then it is simply a port for the 10 CFM or 25 CFM fan, whatever we're using, to blow into the cooker. Now when we open this spin plate here, now all of a sudden we start to get an effect in this zone here which draws air into these three triangular vent holes. So now when the guru blows through this center hole it creates a venturi effect which will suck air so to speak from these other three holes so it gives it a tremendous boost in terms of the air you would ordinarily get from the guru fan alone. Similarly when we use it for grilling, we can control the air because the internal firebox is designed to suck air in under the charcoal and up through the charcoal. And the design of the firebox in combination with the monster vent is what makes the firebox burn from the bottom when you're cooking indirectly and to ignite the entire mass when you're grilling and have the lid off. In many ways, the meat monster represents a new generation of cooking that's trying to find a way for the outdoor chef to make things easier, more predictable, and to be able to walk away and to leave it alone. Many of these features have been quite easy to get used to. One feature that has taken a little while to catch on is the departure from the round design to the rectangular design. Now the round design has been around for years and it has worked well. We've all seen round smokers parked here and there. But the problem with the round design is you can't build a shelf of the same dimension and work with it up and down. So when we take a look at this simple diagram here, it allows us to be able to have shelves of the same dimension at different levels. It makes it a lot easier to work with it. So to summarize, the advantages of the rectangular design, the vertical travel of the shells is unlimited as I just demonstrated in the previous diagram. Also, when you lift the lid up, you have wide open access to do a whole hog or shoulders or pizzas. And it's easier to make it airtight because you have one perimeter rather than cut out for the doors where you have to try to seal all of those rectangular cutouts. And the cup lid, as you lift the lid just a little ways, you don't need to swing it back like you do in the round cookers. Just lift it up a little bit and that cupped lid holds heat. And the flat surface is easier to clean on the bottom. 
And another significant feature in terms of manufacturing is that you can buy pickle and oil steel, which is a much higher quality, in flat sheets, and then we bend it and shape it. Whereas if you go to buy round tubular steel, which typically we do when we build our round cookers, is that you have to go with what they have, and you oftentimes have porosities, you don't have the smoothness, and it's harder to paint, and it's also not as clean for the welding. So for all of these reasons, we find that it's best to have a rectangular design. Thank you for your attention, and I would also like to say thank you to all of the competition cookers and to all of the family outdoor chefs who have contributed suggestions which have been very helpful to us in the fabrication of our products. If you have any questions, please feel free to give us a call. Thank you again.